Hello and welcome to GameStack. Let's check out some more franchises that got a second chance. And that's basically when the franchise has been dead for a while. The publisher resurrects it, hoping that the gaming public will see the familiar name and buy it up. Sometimes it works out pretty well, other times not so much. A first is a franchise that had a short but noticeable break in its life. Tomb Raider from Core was originally designed for the Saturn, but released first on the PlayStation in 1996 because, well, money talks. You play as Lara Croft and your job is to raid tombs and get their goodies. Naturally, there's some action during the course of your tomb raiding adventure. This first game uses tank controls, which you do get used to, but overall, they're kind of laggy and cumbersome. The graphics for their time, though, are fantastic, and exploring is fun, at least for a short while. I bought this version when it was released, but I never got much into it, maybe about an hour and a half or so, and I just never really played it again. Well, I did when it needed to be shown on the show here, but never beyond that. Other people really love it, though, and it got sequel after sequel over a couple of different timelines. This would more or less continue until Tomb Raider Underworld came out in 2008. This came out for all of the modern platforms at the time. This is the PlayStation 2 version because that's what I have access to, even though this is the least modern of the platforms it came out for. The developer had changed from Core to Crystal Dynamics by this point. I'm not really fond of this one because there's no way to invert the camera. It starts you off with a swimming puzzle where you're supposed to find the axles for this rotating thing by the large jellyfish. I've looked and they don't seem to be anywhere. I know someone in the comments will let me know. Anyway, we wouldn't hear anything from the main Tomb Raider series ever again. Until we did, five years later with Tomb Raider in 2013. Yeah, it's just called Tomb Raider. This is the first game in a new timeline. It came to the modern consoles of the time and was eventually even ported to the newer ones. This is the PlayStation 3 version. Once again, the developer is Crystal Dynamics and boy, they sure learned a lot since Underworld. The game is not only playable, it's actually enjoyable. Lara feels a bit younger in this one. The game itself feels like it was inspired by Uncharted, and that series was undoubtedly at least partially inspired by the original Tomb Raider games. You move around in a very nimble fashion, easily grabbing onto ledges, climbing, jumping, and what have you. The controls are infinitely more responsive than any other game in the series that I've played which came before this, and I haven't played very many of those. Naturally, there's a lot of action sequences involving various weapons which all feel responsive and, most importantly, fun. Often included are quick time events, requiring you to mash a button to defeat an enemy or simply to survive. There's also some minor crafting or skill tree elements because of course there is. That's why you're always earning XP so you can spend it later. It's not too bad though and certainly not overly complex. The graphics are mostly the same browns and grays from that era. Despite that though, the visuals are still pretty good. More so if you play a version for the newer consoles like the PlayStation 4 or Xbox One X. The sounds are fantastic and in full surround this time out. Like many games of that era, music doesn't usually play unless you're in a battle or something is happening with the story. Overall, this is a great way to modernize the series. It's good that they gave the franchise a second chance because it kept going until Shadow of the Tomb Raider, which is the newest mainline game. This one came out in 2018, so it's not that new anymore. There's also been a few non-mainline games scattered about here and there. A follow-up to this one hasn't been officially announced at the time I'm making this video. It's expected soon, though. I'm fairly sure it's going to be a continuation of this timeline. Jam and Earl from JVP and Sega came to the Sega Genesis in October of 1991. In this game, two aliens from the planet Funkatron crash land on Earth. Now you need to wander Earth and find all of the parts to your spaceship before you can take off and go back home. That's right, this is Earth, and the developers did a lot of research on Earth to make sure the game looks as close to it as possible. Seems fairly accurate to me. In each level, you wander around, looking for the elevator to take you up to the next level. Some levels have parts for your ship that you've got to find. The worlds are generated randomly, which makes this a roguelike, I guess. I'm usually not a fan of these, but for this game, it works because it's not a claustrophobic dungeon. 
The Earthlings here are crazy, and they'll make sure to go out of their way to bug you as you're wandering. And that's basically all you do in this game is walk around. It's not for everyone, but if you just want to chill, this one's pretty fun. Fortunately, the music is great, especially considering that they use the usually horrible gem sound driver. Two years later, we got Toe Jam and Earl Panic on Funkatron, also on the Genesis. Now, the game is a side view platformer. After the first game, a bunch of Earthlings hitched a ride on your ship back to your home planet, and now they're causing havoc. You've got to trap them all with jars and ship them back to Earth. But first, you've got to find them. It's a weird departure from the first game, but it can actually be a lot of fun in its own right. The graphics are a ton better this time out, and so is the music. I mean, it's actually in stereo now. All in all, this is a quirky, yet still fun game that gets overlooked a lot. After this, we'd never hear from Toe Jam and Earl again. Until nine years later on the original Xbox with Toe Jam and Earl 3, Mission to Earth. You're back on Earth in this one. It returns to the wandering around scheme of the first game, only there's a lot more to do here. It features a hub world with entrances to all of the other stages. In order to unlock them, you need to collect keys in all of the different stages. So basically it's very similar to the games that were popular at the time that used this concept, like Diddy Kong Racing or what have you. There's also a third character you can play as now named Letitia, but apparently she's not good enough to have her name in the title. Like the first game, humans will try to hurt you, but you can use your funk foo a couple of times to convert them to being nice. The gameplay is silky smooth in this one, and it looks fantastic, looking even more accurate to Earth than the first game, if you can believe it. It also has some great music, but usually it's very quiet and relegated almost to being a second thought, which is a shame. Overall, this title is a good one, but it can get repetitive. Still, I was glad that they brought the series back, but maybe it didn't sell very well. In fact, we'd never hear from Toe Jam and Earl again. Until we got Toe Jam and Earl back in the groove in 2019 from Human Nature. This was released on most of the modern consoles of the time, and this is the Switch version. Now the duo is back for a third chance. Letitia is here, so they didn't forget about part three. We even have a new character named Lawanda. Basically, this is a complete remake of the first game with a slightly different story, but with the same gameplay, only upgraded to take advantage of the exciting new millennium that we live in. Once again, you wander around the various levels looking for parts to your ship. And of course, you also need to find the elevators to the next level. The worlds can be fixed or generated randomly. There's also an online component to the game if you're into that. All of the various Earthlings are back to bug you, but you have some new ones that weren't in the original because they didn't exist yet. Like the dude on a Segway who's putzing around in various areas. Or how about the dude erratically flying his drone? Or maybe the kid playing his Game Boy who's oblivious to his surroundings. Sega would have never let that slide in the original game, but Sega has nothing to do with this one. Also, is that Solid Snake following me around? I also really like the ghost cow. That's right, a ghost cow. The game briefly pauses sometimes when it loads more of the map. I'm not sure if that's a Switch thing or if it does it on the other consoles as well. The frame rate here averages around 46 frames per second, so I assume it runs at 60 on the PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. But then again, this game uses the Unity engine, so who knows? Hey, I mean, that's still better than the 30 frames per second of the original Genesis version. The music is once again fantastic, with lots of new stuff. And it's not played quietly either, I like that. There's not a ton of repetition in the music, which is good. The game itself can be repetitive, of course, but fortunately it saves your progress. Overall, this isn't as impressive as Toe Jam and Earl 3 was, but you can tell this was an indie title, and that's why. There's still plenty of fun to be had here if you enjoyed the very first game. Is the franchise back for good? Only time will tell. Now these next two franchises were very, very much in demand while they were dead, and it took forever and a day for them to be revived. 
and both of them have their share of satisfied players and, of course, their naysayers. Streets of Rage from Sega came to the Genesis in 1991. This was basically Sega's answer to Final Fight. It came out as they were gearing to defend themselves against the launch of the Super Nintendo around that same time, so this worked to their advantage when people compare this against Final Fight on that system. The characters here are smaller and the movement of everything a little less smooth, but as a game, it's a lot better. If you crank up the difficulty, the enemy can come at you like crazy. You do have a special attack which calls in a cop car to help you deal with certain situations, but you can't just keep doing this willy-nilly. The graphics are certainly dated, but still good for their time, especially considering that the entire game is only a wimpy 4 megabits. But what almost everyone talks about is the music by Yuzo Koshiro. At the time, we just hadn't heard stuff like this in video games before. It's a fun game, and both it and the music are still enjoyable today. Of course, Streets of Rage 2 came out the next year, and it really amped things up. The game was now smoother with much bigger characters. Pretty much everything about this was improved thanks to it having four times the memory. Once again, the soundtrack is incredible. This is widely regarded as one of the best, if not the best, beat-em-up of all time, and I agree with that assessment. Sega was on a roll, so about a year and a half later, we got Streets of Rage 3. This is a great game, but it does take a step back in a few areas. The colors they chose for the characters were simply bad. The music was described as experimental this time around. Some of it's still really good, but other tracks definitely aren't. The gameplay is mostly top-notch, though, with some cool moves added and the attacks are a lot faster. Unfortunately, the game's balance has been compromised compared to the Japanese original. And so, the Streets of Rage series faded away, despite still being very much in demand. They tried to revive the series a couple of different times, but it never happened. Until November of 2019, when we finally got Streets of Rage 4. The first thing most people notice about this one is how it looks, and it's a bit weird. Yes, it does look like a mobile game or a Flash game in some respects. I think a lot of that is due to the thick black outlines which mobile and Flash games love to use. Seriously, what is the fascination with the thick black outlines? It's ugly. Stop it. Still, you will eventually get used to how it looks and just play the damn game. The backgrounds look great. The music is pretty good as well, with Yuzo Koshiro returning to do a handful of tracks. I wish he would have done the entire game, but they had different ideas, I guess. As far as the game itself goes, it plays great. Some people will tell you that this is their favorite beat-em-up ever. I'm not one of those people who are going to tell you that, though, but don't get me wrong, I do like it. It's definitely good, but I do often find myself getting a little bored as I play, which wasn't an issue with parts 1 and 2. It happens a lot on other beat-em-ups, though. It has 12 very long levels, which is more than your typical beat-em-up, but I think they would have probably gotten a lot of flack had they included less in this day and age. Still, I've got to say that this was a very successful resurrection of the franchise, as it's been well-received by most people. I wonder if there's going to be a Streets of Rage 5. Hmm. Remember Shenmue from Sega? This ambitious game was released on the Dreamcast in the final days of 1999 in Japan and in late 2000 everywhere else. You play as Dio, as some but not all people in the game call him. You watched your father get killed by Lan Di, and now you're off on an adventure to avenge his death. You're filled with a lot of anger, and you basically just devote your life to this, even though you're still in high school. Typical high schooler train of thought for you. You wander around town getting clues as you talk to people. Um. You'll also get in occasional fights, and you'll learn new moves and level them up throughout the game. There are also quick time events, and this is the game that made them popular. Well, maybe popular is the wrong word. It made them mainstream. And of course, you could spend all day playing arcade games instead of avenging your father. Sorry, Dad, but I've got my priorities. 
I adored this game back then, as it was way ahead of its time, and so did a ton of other people. However, a bunch of other individuals didn't care, and the game didn't sell tremendously well, or at least as well as Sega had hoped. It was still able to get a sequel with Shenmue 2 in 2001, though. This Dreamcast game came out in Japan and Europe, but not in North America because Sega had made a deal with Microsoft before it could be released. I imported the European version and played it anyway, and it's an even better game that ends with a cliffhanger. North America got Shenmue 2 on the Xbox in 2002. It's still a great game, and slightly better than the Dreamcast version in a few ways, and inferior in others. For example, it feels a bit smoother and quicker, but it doesn't look quite as clean. It's like they smudged Vaseline on it or something. It was also kind of weird playing this on a non-Sega console, as it hadn't been long at all since Sega stopped making consoles. With Sega's financial troubles and the large cost of the game, the continuation of the Shenmue series would be put on indefinite hold. Until 2015, when Shenmue 3 was announced at E3, and it was put on Kickstarter, where it eventually raised over $6 million. But before that could come out, we got Shenmue 1 and 2 HD on the PlayStation 4, Xbox One, and PC. These, which you can probably figure out if you have more than six working brain cells, were HD ports of the first two games to get fans in the mood for the upcoming Shenmue 3. While it was certainly nice to see Shenmue getting some love, these ports were very buggy, especially if you got them right away. Let that be a lesson to you. Never buy a game right away. Ever. I certainly learned my lesson. Maybe if the publishers could learn their lesson, this wouldn't be an issue going forward. Even nowadays, a little bit of the music still isn't right and the games are too contrasty. You can adjust the gamma up to 90 and the contrast to 12, and then it looks pretty damn good. I'd still say that this is a good way to give the first two games a go if you haven't tried them before. In 2019, Shenmue 3 finally arrived, and I got it on the PlayStation 4. After all this time, Shenmue 3 was finally here. In fact, I did an entire video on this game after I first beat it. So, is it Shenmue? Yeah, mostly. Was it as good as the first two games? Sadly, no. This one feels fairly small, especially during the first half. I was afraid that the entire game was going to take place in this village that you're in, as they spend a lot of time here. It feels like it's padded for length, with lots of menial things that you need to do. Granted, the first two games were like this as well, but not to this extent. You? Fortunately, you do move on and go to a city, and the game becomes better. This city is really big, but it feels kind of lifeless compared to how the first two games were. There are fewer people wandering around, and you can't talk to absolutely everyone like you could in the first two games. You also can't play Sega arcade games here. This is as close as you're gonna get. I wish Sega would have just let them use their games, especially those from 1986 instead of this Virtua Fighter 2 thing. The jobs and the quest are decently fun, but it didn't grip me the same way. The ending especially left me feeling rather empty. Maybe a game like this needs more than a $6 million budget? I don't know, but let's just say it leaves room for a Shenmue 4. It's been four years, and there's no indication that will ever happen. Is this still worth playing? Well, yes, I definitely think so. And if you can, play it on the PlayStation 5 like I am here so you can get an almost constant 60 frames per second. It looks so smooth compared to playing it on the pathetically weak PlayStation 4. Seriously, just throw your PlayStation 4 in the trash where it belongs. Like the first two games, this one isn't for everybody. In fact, you can look at the comments on this video to see people complaining about the franchise. And they really love to do that. Sad to say, I don't think Shenmue has enough mass market appeal to ever finish off the series as it was meant to be. Hey, I hope I'm wrong though. Excuse me. Have you heard the news? Apparently, there's a karate master in Yawu. Huh? Word has it, he's a Japanese guy wearing a leather jacket and jeans and a bandage on his face. Uh, hi. They say he's an incredibly violent individual who has already sent dozens of people to the hospital. Huh? I'm really scared. But at the same time, I kind of want to meet him. <laughs> These last two both started as fantastic arcade games that eventually got turned into franchises. Well, one more so than the other. And it seems that only one of them is still going.
Here's Strider from Capcom, which was released in the arcades in 1989. I talked about Strider not too terribly long ago in an episode about spiritual follow-ups, but this episode is different. Regardless, I need to go over the original real quick here. As you can see, you control a ninja who jumps around a lot and slashes with the sword. The game is super cool, and for its time, it was amazing. It's a short game that only has five levels, but each level packs a ton of variety and different scenes as you play. Capcom could simply do no wrong back in the days when their arcades were powered by their CP system boards. Needless to say, this game helped make Strider very popular and sequels were expected. Strider also came to the NES in 1989. This actually isn't a port of the arcade game, and the two games were developed alongside each other. You're off looking for Kane, and you need some info about what's going on. You need to collect discs, analyze them, and lots of other mundane things. The physics in this game are quite awful, and the game is anything but tight. If you want to know how seriously bad the code in this game is, be sure to check out Displaced Gamer's videos on this particular game. He spells it out in great detail about how broken this game is. Capcom didn't assign their A-team to this one, though honestly a lot of NES games from Capcom were horrendously glitchy. In 1990, we got Strider 2, which would later be known as Strider Returns, and it showed up on the Genesis in 1993. This tier text developed offering from US Gold is utter trash. It makes the NES version of Strider look almost competent, at least from a game design perspective, probably not a coding one. But don't get me wrong, this one is also quite broken as far as the gameplay is concerned. I don't know why Capcom allowed other entities to make horrible versions of their games. It happened a lot. I guess they were more interested in the money than they were their reputation. Capcom eventually made their own Strider 2 in 1999. It also showed up on the PlayStation, which is the version you're looking at here. It's mostly identical. This is so much better than US Gold Strider 2 with some great action and new polygons as well as some heavy pixelation in some parts. Overall, this is a good one, but even after all this time, it can't quite hold up to the original. After this, Strider was shelved forever, to be forgotten by everyone who had ever lived. Until 2014, that is, when Strider came back with Strider. Yeah, here we go again with the new game having the same name as the original. This was available digitally for all of the platforms at the time except Nintendo's stuff. It only came out physically in Japan for the PlayStation 3, I believe. And that's the worst version. The one I'm showing you here today is the PlayStation 4 version. This one plays as an action game, however, pretty much like all modern games in the last decade, you acquire new abilities and more life as you progress. This isn't necessarily a bad thing, mind you, but you can definitely feel the modern influence on this one. It also makes it a Metroidvania as there's some backtracking, and well, that's the rule. I think I'm eventually going to get so loose with this rule that anything that allows your character to face the opposite direction is a Metroidvania. Hey, you can't blame me, I just like saying Metroidvania. The action will be familiar to Strider fans as he can cling to walls and slash with his sword. Eventually, you'll earn a double jump, just like with all of these types of games. This one keeps going and going, but there are a lot of checkpoints that save automatically. Unfortunately, there's only one save slot, which is an absolute crime in my opinion. The game looks okay. However, it's extremely dark. Even with the in-game brightness cranked all the way up, it's very dark and kind of boring looking. The environments don't have a lot of variety either. You'll spend most of your time inside buildings climbing through various nooks and crannies. Often, some text will cover the bottom parts of the screen to advance the story that absolutely nobody cares about. Sometimes the bosses will talk at you as you fight them, and this gets really annoying because it can literally cover your character. Come on, just use voice instead of text. To top it all off, the game screen is covered with weird fake scan lines, but you have to think about them to notice them. The sound and music are both very soft. Some of the music can be decent, but it's treated like something that's not very important. Overall, the game is fun, but it's not amazing. However, it was only $15. I'm not sure if this second chance worked out as well as Capcom hoped it would, despite selling over a million units, as we haven't heard from Strider since.
Contra from Konami was released to the arcades in early 1987. This one or two player run and gun was a tremendous success, being the fourth highest grossing arcade machine of that year. You play as a human badass trying to kill some alien invaders. It's a tough game, especially because the vertical aspect ratio works against it in some stages, but it's still a lot of fun. Even better is the port to the NES that came the following year. Back then, it was one of the few games on the console that allowed two players to play at the same time. That was pretty novel. This version was also a massive success, and honestly, it's a lot better than the arcade version. Even the music is better. Thanks to this port, Contra would become a massive hit with gamers and made them want more. And Konami gave them more. Sometimes the follow-ups were outstanding games, like Contra 3 for the Super NES here. It really doesn't get much better than this. Sometimes the sequels were either just okay or even absolute trash. This would continue off and on for over 20 years. Then, in 2011, we got a digital-only game called Hardcore Uprising for the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360. I mention this game every chance I get because it's never gotten enough love. Developed by Arc System Works, the game takes on an anime visual vibe. At first, it's easy to get turned off by the game. It'll absolutely wreck you. But as you keep playing the rising mode, you collect points which can then be used to purchase upgrades in the shop. And it gets kind of addictive making sure you get everything. Once you do, the game is much easier, though it's still a challenge. You'll get tremendously good at it from playing each of the stages again and again to rack up all those points you need. The game did the concept of powering you up with new abilities in a much more satisfying way than Strider 2014 did. It adds so much more to Contra, like mid-air dashes, double jumps, and even deflecting shots. Many of the stages look gorgeous, even though they're built out of polygons. A couple might look a bit average, but the game is always fun. The music is hard rocking most of the way through, and the soundtrack makes you want to keep playing. It's truly an excellent game. Unfortunately, Konami decided that they didn't want to attach the Contra name to the game's title, even though this is 100% a true Contra game. I feel the game's sales suffered because of this. Supposedly, it sold less than 200,000 copies, both platforms combined. Also, I feel that the lack of a physical version hurt it because back then it was fairly uncommon for games not to have one. Both of these moves gave gamers the impression that Konami had very little faith in the title. Whichever complete moron at Konami made these decisions might have even killed the Contra franchise, as no Contra games would ever be made again for all eternity. Until they made one in 2019 called Contra Rogue Corps. This one was developed by Toy Logic. This one's on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC. I'm playing on the PlayStation 4 here. They went with a 3D overhead-ish view for this one. Not only that, it plays like a twin-stick shooter, but you still need to fire with the R2 button. Not only that, but your weapons have a heat gauge and will overheat if you fire for too long. Not only that, but it's boring as hell. Seriously, Konami decides to put the Contra name on this, but not Hardcore Uprising? What the hell? If it weren't for all of the bad games in the Contra series that used a similar view to this, this wouldn't even be a Contra game. Why did they only take inspiration from the bad Contra games? Anyway, you have two weapons that you can switch between at any time. You also have a dash move that can stun enemies. When they're stunned, you can throw them or do a finishing move which tries to be all crazy insane. Ooh, look how much fun this game is, Wee! Yeah. You even have a bomb which also tries to look super hardcore, but it just doesn't have the impact that I think they were going for. Tons and tons of enemies rush you from all angles, yet still somehow it gets repetitive. Also, why does my name need to be shown on screen by my character at all times, even in single player mode? I know what my name is, and I know where my character is. Thank you. There is a weapons and item shop where you can upgrade your character, and that's cool, but the way they put it together is a bit confusing and over-designed. The way Hardcore Uprising did it was much more clear and fun. The graphics are extremely dull and dark. All the areas that I've seen look pretty much exactly the same. It can't even run at 60 frames per second on the PS4 Pro here. I'm not gonna soil my PlayStation 5 with this one. That's right, I had to dig the PS4 out of the trash. The music has some Contra motifs here and there, but it's very understated and certainly doesn't pump you up. However, they went ham on the radio buddy. You know what ham means, right? If not, ask someone. 
But seriously, your radio buddy knows where you are, what you're doing, and everything that's around you at all times. I wish this trope would die. It's amazing the amount of radio buddy there is, but for some reason, the cutscenes have no voices at all. Very strange. To say that I'm disappointed with this game is an understatement. They gave Contra another chance and totally ruined it. Apparently, they've learned their lesson, as soon we're gonna get Contra Operation Galuga. This will be a side-scrolling return to form developed by Way Forward, so it has a much better chance of being good. I am a tad concerned that the stages seem to be mostly a collection of greatest hits from fun moments of past games instead of providing new fun moments, but we'll see. It could just be that's what they're choosing to show for the trailer. In the meantime, avoid Contra Rogue Core if you're looking for a Contra game. If you're not looking for a Contra game, well, then this one isn't super horrible, I suppose. And there you go, more franchises that have been resurrected. So, what do you guys think? Do you think there's gonna be a Shenmue 4? How about a Streets of Rage 5? Or any of the other franchises I talked about in this episode, do you think they'll get follow-ups? You know the drill, let me know. In the meantime, thank you for watching GameSag. today. I'm not in the mood to talk now. What's his problem? He's definitely in the mood to talk now. Look at him chatting away with Mr. Hardhat over here. Try again. Um, oh no, no, no. I've been too tired lately. Okay, well, he probably sucks at avenging people anyway. Let's try someone else. Okay, I bet this girl would be good at revenging. Try talking to her. Do you have a minute? Excuse me, but, um, uh, sorry. Bye now. Boy, it sure sucks to be you, doesn't it? Maybe this girl can help. Excuse me? Yes? You got her, Dio. Don't let her get away. Um, sorry. Please let me enjoy my break in peace. I guess so. Oh, man, you suck. How about this chick with the umbrella? Try her. Noriko. Yeah. You got her attention. Now, ask her about revenge. I don't have time for this. Get lost. Wait, Dio! Dio! Okay, Dio, what are you doing? You can't avenge your dad by playing Hang On. Well, okay, passing these other racers might avenge your father just a little bit. Also, don't forget to turn left or right if the road curves left or right. Oh no! You lost! Let's see how close you got to avenging your father. Only about halfway there. Hey, Joe, this is your father. I was able to hack in from another world. Please avenge me! By playing darts! Yeah, that's the way. Excellent throw! 
What? This isn't the way? Where did you learn to throw? Oh. Yeah. For my father. Oh, yeah. Yandy could never achieve such a score. I am avenged! Alright, Joe, you can go home now.